Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Cindy. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Here I thought I was the only one who had to listen to myself nonstop. <laughs> it's nice to have a partner. <laughs> I introduced myself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous um, for a number of reasons. First of all, because my sponsor suggested it uh, about four and a half years ago. And he suggested it because it says to introduce yourself that way in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, on page X. I, 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 if that's how you say it in Roman numerals, um, he believed, and I have come to believe, that it is a way to acknowledge my increasing health after 10 years of acknowledging my increasing disease. I feel best today about my membership in this program than anything else in my life, and that's the most important reason that I want to share with you what sobriety is like for me. I misled myself a lot in the early days of my sobriety. I hear things in a strange way. Um, And when you said to me, if you'll quit drinking, things will get better, I thought you meant things would never be bad again. That's how I hear things. I understand today that you meant everything would get better. The joy would be better, and the pain would be better. The gains would be better, and the losses would be better. The anguish and the heartache would outstrip anything I ever experienced drinking and using, and so would the joy and happiness. Sobriety, as I understand it today, is not for the faint-hearted. And if you're new today, and if you feel a little faint-hearted, stay with us, because this fellowship is the experience you will, it's where you will find the incredible strength that is a part of who you are. The first step that we admitted we were powerless over alcohol is, for me, a daily reminder that the moment I admit and acknowledge my weakness in any area, I almost immediately, through the training in this program, find my strength. Because when I know how I'm weak and accept it, I begin to discover how I'm strong. And I've been more able all the time to accept that. It's been very hard for me to accept my strengths in this program. I can account for, uh, I can list easily all of my weaknesses, but it is very hard for me to accept and own how I'm strong. I talk often about the dignity and grace of a recovering alcoholic woman. I think that we, the only way we're different in our dignity and grace is that it is so precious to us because we lost it so completely. I have come to understand in sobriety that dignity and grace includes a lot of things I used to didn't include. Um, Now I know that I can have dignity and grace while sobbing at a podium in front of 7,000 people. Uh, I didn't know that until I did it and until people came up to me afterward and said that was beautiful. I didn't know I could be that real. I could be that authentic. I didn't know it would be okay to be who I am until I came to you. And the reason for that, as others have already mentioned, is because I grew up in an alcoholic home, in a situation in which it was not okay to be who I was. It was only safe to try to figure out what you wanted and give it to you. And in that process, I lost the only important person in my life, myself. I lost complete touch with who and what I am. And I've rediscovered that in Alcoholics Anonymous. It has been a joyous journey and an excruciating journey. Before I forget, I want to thank Janique for calling me and inviting me, and thank you all for the hospitality. Um, 
I've decided that I will ask Denise to book all of my future conferences. Um, she does a wonderful job. She had Booth and Kathy uh, pick me up at the airport. We had a very safe and very sedate drive back, uh, two and a half hours, I think it was. <laughs> I guess maybe not. <laughs> it seemed rather long. <laughs> Um, about twice as long as the flight, actually. <laughs> but we had a delightful conversation and learned a lot about each other. Um, and and I, I also want to thank uh, Janine for the escort she provided. Um, no matter how little she had to do with it, in my mind she had a lot to do with it. I've enjoyed very much spending time with Joe and, and she is um, driving me from here to there and I haven't had to walk like Clancy. <laughs> Maybe you could handle Clancy next time to me. <laughs> um, it's a delight to be here. I've never been to Wyoming, and all of a sudden I'll be in Wyoming twice in one year, um, also in October, and it's very nice to be here. Um, in January of 1972, I walked into a restaurant in Kansas City, Missouri, um, where I very seldom went to eat breakfast, which I very seldom ate. And I sat down at the only seat available at a counter next to a tall, handsome man, which I often try to do. And I began to try to eat something because I hadn't eaten for a while. I had been on a fairly long run of alcohol and narcotics. At the time, I was working for a veterinarian, um, and veterinarians uh, supplied me unknowingly with morphine. I had developed, um, I hit upon the, the process of pulling two cc's of morphine out of a bottle of morphine sulfate and replacing it with two cc's of sterile water testing it periodically to make sure it would still work on the dogs. Um, and the veterinarian began to notice that the dogs were screaming as they went into surgery, and absolutely nothing bothered me. <laughs> and uh, even the telephone didn't bother me that much. <laughs> he had said that the last few weeks of our relationship were to be the last few weeks, that he could no longer afford um, my secretarial skills, and he had said, if you don't do something, we'll have to end our relationship, our business relationship. Um, so that Saturday morning, I walked into the restaurant and sat down next to the stranger and tried to eat my breakfast. I was not good at eating. Um, I had actually lost the ability to get anything but liquid down my throat. Um, and I compensated with, for that by putting things in my veins. Uh, so I felt I was doing well enough. Um, the man next to me began a conversation, and he said, it looks like you've had a rough time. And I sort of shrugged him and noticed that he was what I called in those days clear-eyed and fearless, uh, one of the pink and unused church people probably that don't know anything about life and suffering and struggle. Um, arrogance is among the things I have worked on for 14 and a half years. And um, I just think I've made progress when I have an experience that reminds me how little progress I've made. I'll talk more that, about that as I go. He said, I really understand I uh, am an alcoholic. And I said, well, I'm not. I'm a junkie. He said, you smell funny. And I said, well, I drink to stay off drugs. And he said, does it work? I said, no, it doesn't. He said, I have some friends I'd like for you to meet. That man's name was David. And David took me to a friend of his named Bill. Bill was six foot six, redheaded, gorgeous. Bill introduced me to Alcoholics Anonymous in what I believe today is the only way I could have ever been interested in this program. He took me to bed and then he took me to a meeting. 
I noticed on the blackboard that there was a uh, discussion of the 13th step. I did not attend. <laughs> Uh, only because I think it was at 3 o'clock in the morning or something. Um, for the first few years of my sobriety, I often felt guilty about the way I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, as I have heard other people say, I came here for the wrong reason. I do not believe that today. God, as I understand God, walks with me into experiences that only I will understand. And that power, greater than I am, knew what it would take to get my attention. He knew how to help me want what you have. And that experience was provided for me. I do not think there is a wrong reason for coming to the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know, after 14 years, that if you come for the wrong reason, you will eventually stay for the right reason. Ultimately, that's what the steps are about to me in my life. The 12 steps have helped me stay here for the right reason, to protect and honor a life of sobriety in a society that does not give you the right not to drink. You may have noticed that you were more accepted as a falling down drunk than you are accepted as a person who does not drink. We have to be very creative, very attentive, and very disciplined to protect and maintain our right not to drink. It is a right for me today. It is a right and a privilege that I earn on a daily basis through this program. I know now how not to drink. And as I tell you the experiences of my sobriety, I want you to believe that I wanted, just like you might want, to hear people say, I got sober and it's been wonderful ever since, and believe that. And I heard that a lot, and I have come to know that I got sober 14 years and four months ago, and I have known the greatest pain, the greatest loss, the greatest tragedy, the most excruciating agony that I have ever known in my life in sobriety. And it has not been necessary for me to pick up a drink or a drug. I have turned to this fellowship time and time again. I have turned away. I don't mean away in terms of walking away. I mean away to life outside of this fellowship. <clears throat> I bring this fellowship to my life outside, and I bring my life outside back into this fellowship. And that's what this process is about for me. Um, I did not maintain continuous sobriety in Kansas City. I saw Gary from Utah a little bit ago, and Gary and I were together at an international conference of young people in 1972. That conference impressed me so deeply in my 30 days of sobriety or 60 days of sobriety that I went back to Kansas City and got me walking drunk because it seemed to me <clears throat> that it was probably impossible for me to ever love the way it felt like you loved. It seemed to me that I was so empty of the ability to give a flying damn about anything and that I'd never have that ability back again. I laugh at that today or smile at it because I feel so deeply and so often and so much. And I remember myself 14 years ago fondly struggling, believing I'd lost the ability to care. The beauty of this experience in AA is that you cared about me, and I knew it, and I didn't know why, and I didn't know what you were caring about, we seem to be able to see whatever is left in the people who come to us. That is our strength. That is our magic. We see only what's left, not what's gone, not what could have been, not what might be in the future, but it, what is left right now. And we keep looking at that. And, of course, the more you look at it, the more it grows. The more you look at anything you'll discover, the more it grows. 
almost without exception. And we keep focusing our time, energy, and attention on that essence that is left. There wasn't much left of me. I weighed 80 pounds. 40 of that was liver and dirt. I um, I was a struggling, drunken junkie trying to figure out what combination of scotch and morphine would keep me from feeling like I was going to fly into pieces. Um, I came into AA. I sat in the AA club in Kansas City, and I kicked morphine, shivering, chattering, crying, sobbing, eating candy bars, drinking juice with God knows what in it, AA cocktails, they're called. Um, and when I look back on it, the only thing I know that made a difference was that people sat with me. And they just sat there. And they just nodded. And they cared a lot. And I almost hated them for caring in an interesting way because I didn't know what was left of me to care for. But they did. And that's all that counted. Uh, when I was six days sober, a man in the AA club in Kansas City did for me something I'll never forget, obviously. He had, at that point, ten days of sobriety, and he came running across the AA hall when I came in the door, and he took me by the hand, and he said, Cindy, I quit shaking today. If you think you haven't been sober long enough to help another alcoholic, please remember that story. That day, that moment, he saved my life. Because I didn't think I'd ever quit shaking. The man that ran the desk said, Honey, you don't have the shakes, you have the leaps. Things would fly out of my hands. Coffee cups would fly. and They played hearts all the time. The cards would fly out of my hands and... After about two weeks of sobriety, all of a sudden I was holding a hand of cards and I could feel the cards. I thought, my God, there is something left. I wonder what it is. <laughs> I wonder what's left. And I began to try to discover what was left from the damage and the havoc that I had created in my life. I began to want to know what was left. You had transmitted to me the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. You would help me want to know just a little what's left, what might remain after the tragedy of my life. In my drinking, I had lost the right to work on my master's degree. I'd been excused from the university when I was hospitalized with serum hepatitis and chronic heroin addiction. I had lost the right to raise my only son. I had been excused from the state of Kansas, and it's very hard to get kicked out of Kansas, <laughs> no matter what you do. Um, my life seemed to me to be an incredible tragedy. Nothing had gone the way I had hoped it would go. With the bright promise of my youth and my high school days, it had turned dark. And you saw what was left. And that began to come back to life that day in that club when that man said to me, I quit shaking today, and I knew that maybe in four days I could quit shaking. That's all it took. We don't recognize sometimes when we've been sober for a while how little it takes to touch the heart of somebody who hurts so badly. We sometimes say you've got to be careful of the newcomers, say the right things, do the right things. That's not true in my experience. You can't hurt a newcomer. They tell us to stay away from newcomers because old-timers can't handle fooling around with newcomers. But it doesn't hurt newcomers. We show newcomers a kind of love they haven't experienced for a long time. And I know that from my experience and from the experience of the many people I've shared with over the years. So I began to struggle to stay sober. Um, the sober struggle is to me the most heroic human battle, human struggle, human experience I know of. We are involved in a heroic struggle, the struggle for sobriety. And the reason it's a heroic struggle to me is because as the feelings come back, they are so intense. For me, they were so mysterious. They were so confusing. I didn't know if I was in love or in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know if I was angry or going to burst into tears. And it took a long time for me to sort through all of that. And today, I still get confused about it once in a while. 
um, that's a part of this process as I don't understand it sometimes and as I do understand it a lot of the time. Um, in um, late 72 or early 73, a friend in Kansas City let's, said, let's go to a conference in upstate New York. We piled into the car in Kansas City and drove a long way, uh, day and night, and got to the conference. And at that conference, a man was the main speaker, and his name was Tom A. And I fell head over heels in love with Tommy A. On the spot. The interesting thing is that he had the same experience. I've wondered since I had at that point about 30 days of sobriety, and he had about eight years. Yeah. He fooled around with newcomers too. Don't ever let him tell you he doesn't. Um, <clears throat> we began <clears throat> a remarkable journey together. <clears throat> that uh, we left Kansas City and moved to Southern California, moved in with a beautiful man and his beautiful wife, a man named Bob E. and his wife, Taylor. Taylor was dying of cancer, and Bob and I were able to give her medication intravenously, and we tried Valium one day, and it didn't work. It made it worse for her, which often happens with Valium. And Bob put the Valium in the drawer and said, well, we'll take that back to the pharmacist. I was living at the time with three members of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was attending six to eight meetings a week. I was very active in every way I could find to be active. And within two hours, I was down in the basement shooting Valium. It has helped me come to understand that sobriety, as I experience it now, is a property of people. Sobriety does not reside in meetings or in the steps or in working with others. Those are tools that I use to support my sobriety. Sobriety is an inside experience for which I have worked every day of 14 years and four months. It has not been given to me. I used to discount my struggle by saying God gave it to me. As I understand God today, he will give me anything I'm big enough to take, including a syringe full of morphine right now. I can have that. Chuck said to me once, Cindy, if you had everything in the world at your disposal, all material things, all spiritual things, is there anything you would deny your child? Why do you think God would deny you any experience you want to have? You want to die drunk, he'll let it. You want to die sober, he'll allow it. It's up to you. It's like the source of that electricity. I bet the source of that electricity has never said, I'm sorry, you can only be a 40-watt bulb today. It doesn't make those kinds of decisions for light bulbs. Those are decisions that only light bulbs can make. And I'm a light bulb in Alcoholics Anonymous, and today I make a daily decision not to drink and not to use drugs and to do the best I can to face what is often a very confusing life. And I do that on a daily basis. And I go to meetings to share what I've found to, to, to be a part of a group of people who are involved in the same struggle. Meetings do not contain my sobriety. I do. If you find yourself on a desert island where you can't go to meetings, you don't have to drink. And I promise you that. The work you're doing right here, this moment, will be with you, with or without meetings. In fact, my sponsor in Tucson pointed out to me in my 10th year that I was avoiding personal growth by attending so many meetings and working with so many people. I have come to agree with him. There are many people in this fellowship who do not agree with that. And often we agree to disagree. I have come to value personal growth through therapy, psychotherapy, psychiatry, etc. I have learned a lot of things. What made that possible was being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for 12 years before I undertook therapy. I do not recommend therapy before 8 to 10 years of sobriety. It's a whole different ballgame. At any rate, I had a slip in Bob, Earl's house, Bob E.'s house, 
<clears throat> with all those members of AA hanging around, all of his babies that at that time he was firing if they saw a therapist. Um, <laughs> some of you know why that's funny. <laughs> um, and I had a relapse, and I shot Valium in the basement for three days. At the end of that time, I went to Bob one morning, and I said, Bob, I've been shooting Valium in the basement, and I don't know what to do. He said, honey, don't you feel better now that you've told somebody? And that's all he said. You see, that's how deeply into my heart he had gone. He knew that's what made the difference. Don't you feel better now that you've told somebody? And that's the only conversation we ever had about it. A few days later, Bob took Taylor to the hospital. He called one evening, a Monday evening, and said, Taylor is dying. Um, I said, I will wait here by the phone to hear from you. He said, Cindy, how about if you go to the Monday night woman's stag, go for Taylor, go for me, and go for yourself. Now, I had always been, to that point, a strong advocate of what it says in our preamble that Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women. I was, uh, I thought the, the term women's stag was inherently contradictory and I would have no part of such a thing. That's the kind of arrogance I've gotten to struggle with the last 14 years. I went to that meeting that night, and Taylor died during the meeting. It has not been necessary for me to pick up a drink or a drug, and I choose to believe that Taylor passed on to me her sobriety that night to bring to you today. Tom and I were together in Laguna Beach for four and a half years. We had a lovely time. He wrote three or four books and had them published. I went back to the university and completed my Ph.D. in psychology. Um, some people say, isn't that wonderful that you had all that persistence? Because I spent from 1959 to 1977 in college. Um, that is 18 years if you haven't been in college as long as I have. <laughs> And people think that is, a, that is a great devotion, and in a way it is a great devotion, on the one hand. On the other hand, going to college is one of the few things I really do well. I know how to read a book, how to ask you how you'd like for me to understand it, if you're a teacher, and how to give it back to you the way you'd like to hear it. I really do that well. So I spent many, many years working toward a Ph.D., and I finally achieved it in the summer of 1977. It is today, in my opinion, our society's highest award for rigid thinking. Um, I have spent the last five years trying to undo the damage I did spending 18 years in college. I have tried a little at a time to open my mind, to expand my boundaries, to understand in my heart that when I experience a tragedy, it is also an opportunity. And when I experience an opportunity, it is also important to notice how it is a tragedy. Because you get to a point where you look at almost every experience and say, how wonderful, oh, how terrible. And that's what escaped me for a long time going to college, where you begin to suffer from hardening of the categories. Everything fits in a category, but of course nothing fits in a category. We, as Clancy talked about last night, we don't fit in very many categories very well. They've been looking for the alcoholic personality for as long as I've been reading the literature, and they haven't come up with much yet that distinguishes us clearly from other people. And that's a shock for some of us. We feel very different, and we can't believe we aren't. But we're very much like everybody else, even people who aren't members of AA. We have a lot in common with them. <laughs> 
And sometimes it takes a while to discover that or rediscover it. In the summer of 77, I finished my Ph.D. Tom came to me and said, I'm uncomfortable in our relationship. I'm moving down the street. Um, my sponsor, uh, um, a couple of, I went into a state of total shock. I was telling Joe earlier that I have a remarkable ability to see things as they are not and to continue that. The time that I spent in therapy for a year, la- year before last, the therapist focused all of his attention on my inability to distinguish fantasy from reality. I was appalled. I mean, I was 13 years sober at the time, and he would challenge me over and over to look at the fact that I had fantasy confused with reality. My fantasy is that this is going to be a wonderful talk. We are all going to go out up here enlightened and happy forever. And the reality is, if the next word comes out, it will be a miracle. That's fantasy and reality. And I get them all mixed up, all confused, and very distorted. My fantasy was that I had a wonderfully happy marriage, that I had focused a lot of attention on completing a doctoral dissertation for two years, and that as soon as I got done with this incredible piece of work, I would get back to the relationship. One small problem. <laughs> it was a day late and a dollar short, <laughs> to say the least. In the time I had been focused, on the one hand, obsessed, on the other, with my academic work, Tom had fallen in love with another woman. And one of the more remarkable experiences I've had in gaining understanding and experiencing humility was that I was the last person in Laguna Beach, California, who knew that he was in love with another woman. Everybody else knew. And people began to tell me after I found out that they would come by and ring the doorbell and take me to coffee when they knew Tom and his lady were on the beach. So I wouldn't go down to the beach and see them. We're very good codependents, you know. (laughs) We do a lot of enabling as sober recovering alcoholics, or disabling, as I call it. Um, And those people were trying to protect me. I've learned to be very careful when I find myself wanting to protect somebody. Basically, it is a very profound statement of their ignorance and inadequacy that they're unable to take the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune is really not a kind thing to say about them. I don't try to protect the people I love as much as I used to. I try to be available for life as it happens, and it's a great challenge. So my sponsor finally told me that Tom was in love with another woman. Um, He went off with her to somewhere that I from Fargo, North Dakota. See, I did remember. I got a telephone call. I had sent a resume to the University of Arizona a year before. Ironically, I had sent it there because Tom wanted to live in Tucson. So he had really sent my resume to the University of Arizona to see about a job. Two weeks after he left, I got a call from that university. And they said, are you still interested in the job? And I said, yes. I flew to Arizona, I took the job, I moved there. Within a very short space of time, I went from being a happily married student living on the beach in Southern California to being a single professor living in the desert. And I don't have any idea what happened to this day. As I understand it, and as I am very fond of saying, it seems somehow that my life is none of my business. Woody Allen has a wonderful line. Woody Allen says, 80% of life is just showing up. I have come to believe that. I have just shown up. Chuck used to say, Cindy, if you'll just report for duty, ask for a little guidance and direction, and then believe you have it. You see, I only took part of the 11th step. I prayed for the knowledge of God's will, but then I wondered what it was. The whole step, as I take it today, 
is to pray for the knowledge of God's will and know that's what I have the rest of the day. The reality is there isn't anything but God's will. My arrogance, my grandiosity, makes me think once in a while that my will is bigger than God's will and that I can do something against God's will. That's arrogance. That's my grandiosity. That's my belief that I'm a power greater than myself. There is no way for me to go against the will of a God that is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, etc. That means he's everything. The book says it. God is either everything or nothing. If he's everything, we're okay. If he's nothing, what's the big deal? All right? Either way, you're actually covered. <laughs> In a strange sort of way. So I went off to Arizona. I worked at the University of Arizona. I fulfilled a long-held dream of being a professor in a major university. I worked in a two-year graduate program called Addiction Studies. Um, I combined my years of addiction with my years of education and focused them in um, sharing that experience in teaching people how to work in alcohol and drug treatment. Those years were difficult in many ways. I saw through my illusions about universities. You see, I had universities in a fantasy also. My fantasy of a university was a higher education devoted to the higher things of life. The reality is they're in it for money. It took a while to understand that. It, um, and my program was eliminated by the university, uh, and about that time, um, first of all, let me just mention briefly that in 1980, after uh, three years of being in the desert and teaching at the university, um, a student of mine asked if I would serve on a program committee with a number, another member of Alcoholics Anonymous named Bart. Uh, and Bart and Bart's wife and I and two other people worked on the program committee for the 21st International Conference of Young People and Alcoholics Anonymous, which was held in Tucson in May of 1980. It was a remarkable conference. We worked very hard. We worked very well together. Um, and by the time the conference arrived, um, one of the things I had said from podiums like this, and some of you even heard me say it, is that in sobriety, I have never found it necessary to become involved with a married man. That was true. Notice that little teeny word was. I had a habit of judging, as a matter of fact, people who got involved with married persons. It staggers my mind today, my ability to judge others. I know now how it operates in my life. When I judge someone and say, how could she do that? There's this remarkable power of which I am a part that says, well, we're going to find out how she does that, aren't we? We're going to walk right into this judgment and see how it fits. And we're going to give you the opportunity to walk a mile in her shoes. Now, I have gotten to the point, I think, where I am much more careful about judging. I often say to people that I work with, please don't worry about humility. Life delivers it very regularly. <laughs> and if you will just not drink... You will find yourself on your knees, peeing down your legs, sobbing, and you'll know that's humility <laughs> in sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous. It's great. We all come to that <laughs> in one way or another. I also learn the same thing about judging others. When I judge, I have the opportunity for that experience. I am always, as I understand it today, the perfect person for the situation I find myself in. Now, it's very easy for me to say that to you standing here at this podium all dressed up, 
recently showered. It is more difficult for me to say that to you when my life takes a turn for the worst. Life has a habit of that, you may have noticed. It goes up and down, and it takes a turn for the worse and then a turn for the better. And basically, as far as I can tell, it's simply surviving through the hard times, trying to understand if you can, but mainly not asking why. And the question why is really an intellectual anesthetic. It avoids further discovery. Instead, it's important for me to ask how. How did this happen? And what happened is that I fell in love with a married man. Now, I mentioned earlier that I fell in love with Tom. It happened a second time. I had not had the ability to fall in love until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I discovered it, I seem to have discovered it with a vengeance. Because what happens to me, or happens, and possibly I'm through with it. Possibly, who knows? Uh, who cares? <laughs> I become mindless. I try to rationally say this man is married. He has a wife with a new baby. It is not wise to become involved. Do not touch. Do not pass go. Etc., etc., etc. All intellectual. All fantasy. The reality is, I'm tripping him and beating him to the floor. <laughs> Well, it's not quite that bad, but almost. Because what my head talks about is very different from what I actually do. Clancy talked about it beautifully last night. On the one hand, that's my saving grace. In working with newcomers, I don't say to them what I want to say. Instead, I say, tell me about it. (laughs) But on the other hand, it's very difficult to know intellectually I should not do something and walk right into it, like into a propeller blade, like into Bob Earl's wall where you hit the wall and turn left. I walked right into it. We began to have an affair. We had we developed a relationship. He got a divorce. Um, and we began living together. Uh, it was very difficult. Members of AA took sides, which is not unusual. And I don't blame them. I imagine were I outside the situation, I'd have taken a side. I was just the side, I guess, and so I couldn't take sides. That's all right. Um, anyway, um, that was 1980. Barbara and I are still together today, very precariously. Uh, the last year and a half, we've had a remarkably difficult struggle. Um, and... The simplest way to say it and the most efficient way to say it is the way Chuck said it to me seven years ago. He said, Cindy, honey, if he did it to her, he'll do it to you. He has. And he probably will again. The past is still the best predictor for the future. But members of Alcoholics Anonymous have a hard time with that because we have defied that. Our past have not been the best predictors for our future. We have created a new future. I don't know what's going to happen with Bart and I. I know it's an incredible struggle right now. And we cry together a lot and we laugh together a lot. In the last seven years, we've walked through remarkable tragedy, the death of his father, um, the struggle with my son. I have a son who is now 23 years old. Someone asked me earlier if I talk about him a little bit, and I'd really like to talk about him a little bit. Some of you who have heard me snivel about him, I'm, I'm, um, um, I won't tell you exactly Bob E.'s name for me, but it included the word sniveling. And then there was one other word, (laughs) you may know. Um, I snivel well. I've also come to believe that in an interesting way, sniveling works. It really does. If you snivel long enough, things will change. One way or another. <laughs> <He's never right. laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm slowly getting better at not resisting who I am and what I do instead of bringing it to me and saying there are times when all I know how to do is snivel. And it works. It gets me through the experience. My son and I had an incredible... 
raise him when he was six years old. When I got the job at the University of Arizona and moved to Tucson, within a very short time, it seemed very, very short time to me, my then 14-year-old son climbed off a plane. said, hi, Mom. I've come to live with you. If you've lost your children or lost the right to raise your children, hold yourself in readiness. You never know when they're going to step off a plane, a train, a bus, and say, hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Cameron moved in with me um, in uh, the fall of 1977. We had talked to each other on the telephone for a long, long time, made lots of promises, had many, many remarkable fantasies about how our life would be if we ever got the opportunity to live together. In sobriety, I had prayed on almost a daily basis to be allowed to share my son's life. Be very careful what you pray for. I know you've heard that. I want to add another dimension to it. What you pray for, what I pray for, almost always happens in one way or another. Now, sometimes I don't quite notice how it's happening. I've also come to believe that worry is a form of prayer, and that if I worry about something long enough, some version of it will happen. I never manage to worry about the right thing. Uh, what I worry about doesn't happen, and what I don't worry about does. I never would have thought to worry about the things that usually happen, and I never thought to worry about what life with a 14-year-old might be. In my fantasy, it was wonderful. In the reality, it was a long, dark nightmare. <laughs> um, he is today and has been all of this time very devoted to the use of drugs and alcohol. Um, he, he has the motto that I had for many years, without dope there is very little hope. And he believes that sincerely. Um, he, however, is living in Van Nuys, California today, going to school to learn how to repair helicopters. He solved the problem of our relationship by joining the Army and going to Germany for three years. It never would have occurred to me to suggest that. I had him in the probation offices. I had him in the funny farm. Those are all the things that a psychologist thinks of. Never the Army. <laughs> never the Army. And... Um, he called me once from Germany, and he said, Mom, I have a first sergeant who taught me how to make a bed. I said, my God, how did he do that? He said, Mother, you never thought to throw the mattress on the floor if I didn't do it right. <laughs> One trial learning. At any rate, um, today my son has two jobs, uh, works till 11 o'clock at night. He has a girlfriend for the first time in 23 years. He looks wonderful. He sounds wonderful. He um, asks me every once in a while if I wouldn't like some psychedelic drugs. Seriously. He says, come on, Mom, you know, you teach school. You know what psychedelic drugs are. Have it for me. It's remarkable. I mean, wait till your kid tempts you. <laughs> it's a whole new experience. He's a remarkable young man. And today I can say that I'm happy for him, happy for the work he's doing, and I'm especially happy to know him and to have him as a part of my life and to know that we didn't damage our relationship beyond repair in those years that we fought so hard. Um, it, is, it is beautiful to be able to share that with those of you who've heard some of the turmoil. One of the reasons we do not have much turmoil today is that he lives 90 miles away, and it's just right. Um, if you're having a struggle with your kids, get them to move away. <laughs> they become much more precious. In 1983, I got a call from Southern California. Uh, Laguna Beach was from some people I had worked with who said, um, we are putting together the ideal and perfect treatment program. We'd like for you to come and join us. And uh, it's going to be devoted to all the things that the three of us have talked about. 10 years, the possibilities for the treatment of alcoholism that would not violate the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, but that would be a strong and creative addition to a life in AA. I quit my job at the university. I sold my house, my horse, the house that Bart and I had together. Uh, we had a horse, two goats, two cats, two dogs. 
got rid of everything but the cats and dogs, and we moved back to Southern California. That was in the fall of 1983. Um, I worked at that treatment center for a year and a half. I discovered that I do not belong in such an environment as it is constellated today. I am unable to sit back and keep my mouth shut when members of Alcoholics Anonymous share their experience, strength, and hope and get paid for it. When members of Alcoholics Anonymous do not take the energy, the discipline, and the commitment to go to school to learn how to do therapy, a job for which they have the right to be paid, and combine it with their AA experience in treatment. I cannot be a part of the situation in people in which people are forced to go to Alcoholics Anonymous that is against everything I know in my heart about this fellowship. I express my difficulties regularly, and a year and a half, I got fired. Now, I have never been fired while drinking and using drugs. I have been fired any number of times over. It's interesting how that happened, but it has happened. And I got fired basically for resisting the old way and for trying to create a new way. I feel very good today about having been fired for that. Um, Bart and I walked through that together. It was a very difficult time for me, a great turmoil and indecision and confusion. Uh, we made it through. Um, one of my favorite drunks in the whole world and for many years was my father. I adore my father. He's a very special man in a lot of ways. And I'm sure it has something to do with the incredible way that I adore men today, in general. I simply love men. I love what they do. I love the way they smell. I love who they are. And I know it's related to my relationship with my father. He started it. And as a little girl, I followed him all over the place, saying, show me, tell me, teach me how to do it. All of that, all of that um, little girls often do. And I have that same tendency today. My remaining dependency disorder is men. And you must guess that by now. I didn't have to tell you, right? I'm working on it. I'm working very hard on it. And um, the fantasy is that I'm making progress. The reality... <laughs> anyway. In March of 1979... My brother, who was eight years younger than I, and my first baby, my first little love, I took care of him a lot when he was a child. I was eight years old. Every eight-year-old girl loves to have a baby. Little does she know. <laughs> but at eight, it really is fun. And I was blessed with the opportunity to have fun with a child. And in 1979, the week after his 30th birthday, my brother blew his brains out the window of his automobile. He did so in a state of great despair, awesome black depression, deep, deep loss and agony of his own place in the world. As Bob said to me, Cindy, he simply had to shut up the voices. As a result of that tragic loss, I flew to Florida immediately to be with my sister, my mother, and my father. We began to walk through that very painful experience together and do all the things that have to be done at a time like that. Some of you know about them. If you don't, don't rush it. Um, after my brother's funeral, a couple of days went by, and during those days, my father was blind drunk, all of the time he was awake. The only time he wasn't drinking was when he was sleeping. Finally, the third or fourth day, I did what you all have taught me to do 
I picked up the phone and I called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, I need your help. And my dad needs your help. A man came to my father's home who was the perfect person to arrive. Um, he was driving a car a little more expensive than my father's from a neighborhood a little more elegant than my father's with a little better tan than my dad's. And he walked into my father's living room and he put his arm around my dad. And he said to me, said to my dad exactly what had been said to me seven years before. He said, let us love you back into loving yourself. And my father's journey in sobriety began. I had tried to encourage him to explore AA two years before when he got a drunk driving but he was not interested. On this occasion, instead of drinking himself to death over my brother's death, he joined this fellowship and he fell in love. Within a very short time, he was answering phones at central office. He was participating in a lot of ways in the fellowship. He had eight to ten young men with whom he worked. And he said to me one day, Cindy, you know, I am very grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous for my sobriety. But what I am most grateful for is the opportunity to work with young men that I did not have with my only son. This fellowship gives us things we didn't even know we didn't have until all of a sudden we get them back. My dad loved this program very deeply. He was very devoted to it. We shared many hours of laughter and tears and making amends to each other and who did what to whom and what difference did it make. And um, and last February, a year ago this past February, on February 15th, after a long period of confusion and increasing discomfort, I had a psychotic break. And on that day, my father had a fatal heart attack. He died five days later. For some reason, I was unable to be with him in his last days. I will always regret that. I will miss him for the rest of my life. There will be an empty space in my heart where he lives in whatever form he is today. Those are the wounds I have today. As a result of that nervous breakdown, I was hospitalized. I was diagnosed as manic depressive. Um, I began to take a substance called lithium. A lot of people in AA get that confused with Librium and believe it's a psychoactive substance. That's okay. It's okay. I, uh, a woman, after I talked a, a few weeks ago, said, came up to me afterward and said, I love the way you talk and what you said, but I'm very concerned about you taking lithium. How long will you be on it? And I said, well, probably about as long as I'm on the staff. Because taking lithium for manic depression is like taking AA for alcoholism. You either understand that or you don't. Trying to explain that to people is like us trying to explain alcoholism to people who don't understand okay if they don't understand. This will as long as I do. I talk about it from the podium today because since the first time I mentioned it, I have been deluged with calls, letters from people who are struggling in this fellowship with several disorders. Their primary disorder is alcoholism, but it may, like the book says, have covered up some other disorders. And the psychiatrists have been very clear that my years of drinking and drug use probably saved my sanity because I was self-medicating. And after 14 years of sobriety, it flew out of control again. And now I know how to deal with it. I never thought I'd stand at a podium and say I am grateful for drugs and psychiatry. But I am standing here today to say from my heart, I am grateful for drugs and psychiatry as an active, honorable member of Alcoholics Anonymous. If it comes to you to have those kinds of experiences, remember this. You don't have to drink. You don't have to use heroin, morphine, or cocaine. You can be okay. 
dealing with other issues. If they come up in your life. And we have lots of other issues, and they tend to come up in sobriety. That's what sobriety is for. Um, at any rate, sobriety has been, for me, a remarkable journey, a remarkable opportunity to discover more about my weakness and more about my strength, to discover ways to deal with both of those. Today, I teach at a community college in Southern California, and at a small university in Southern California. Another thing has come full circle. I have been appointed by the state of California to supervise veterinarians who get in trouble with drugs and alcohol. I even had the opportunity to point out to a veterinarian with whom I'm working that his mysterious disappearance of drugs might have something to do with his dog nurse. <laughs> that he might check her out. Sobriety is a remarkable experience. It is not for the faint-hearted. If you feel faint-hearted, stay with us and feel how strong your heart becomes, how you can walk through experiences you couldn't even imagine a few years ago, and how those very tragedies, how the tragedy of my brother's death created the opportunity for my brother's, my father's sobriety. Every tragedy has an opportunity. It's very hard to look at it when I'm lost in the tragedy, and I don't even try to anymore. When I'm in the midst of a tragedy, I know now to honor the tragedy, honor the tears, honor the grief and loss. I also know that I will see the opportunity some other day. That's what happened to me 14 and a half years ago. The tragedy of coming to a place like this has been the greatest opportunity of my life. I still don't quite know how I could ever doubt again, but once in a while I do, and that leads to greater faith. Thank God for my doubt. That's how I build my faith. You have contributed to all these years in many, many ways. I've loved having the opportunity to share with Jenny. Uh, my greatest devotion right now is to the experience of relapsing and working with people who experience relapsing. We are unkind to relapsers in Alcoholics Anonymous. There are important reasons for that. We need to protect ourselves. Defense mechanisms are very important. But there is a beautiful way to work with relapsing, and I am going to devote a lot of my professional time to doing that in the future. And I'm grateful Jenny has been here to share her experience and to promote my enthusiasm for that project. I've loved being with you. I've loved sharing with you the spiritual awakening that has come into my life as a result of this program, your love, and our shared experience. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.